Good morning, everyone. Um, OK, so let's continue to explore what we can do from um, uh, DNSSEC analysis and how now we have seen the previous model, how we can generate good quality BAM, how we can move forward by doing some coding. So the first module will be on small variant coding. And uh, later on today, we'll talk about uh, structural variant coding. So what I hope you will learn today is to have an overview of the pipeline that we use to do that, uh, to do the SMD coding, so single detected variant coding. Um, this pipeline is mainly uh, inspired by what I've been proposed in the JTK best practices. Um, I, want, I hope you will understand the basic principle of variant coding. Um, why I say the basic principle? Because each variant coder uses different methods, different algorithms, uh, different um, formula probabilities. Uh, so I cannot give you so much detail on that, but you need to understand how it works. Uh, to understand how we can uh, have the best variant coding, how, and we already um, talked about that yesterday, why, when, when we try to improve the BAM, how this have an impact on the variant coding. So we will uh, revisit this um, this part plus other parts on when we can also uh, use also other methodology to improve the variant coding. Uh, we'll see how to filter and annotate the variant, and uh, also we will learn about uh, the VCF format and a bit of visualization, but you already uh, see it uh, yesterday with uh, AMSA. So before we start, um, just a, a kind of shameless Wonder talk uh, before the, the, the real um, uh, meet. Um, for, for all the people that are Canadian, I would like to, to introduce you um, a non-profit organization, which is called Compute Canada, uh, which is uh, formed by um, federal government. And the goal of this uh, organization is to provide um, high-performance computing resources to uh, researchers in Canada for free. So all that we do, you can do. And us, we use it a lot. We have our own cluster internally, but uh, we use it a lot. So it's a really, really good um, opportunity for all Canadian researchers. Um, especially, you can have a free account with just going there, just sending them a, a registration. If you want more uh, allocation, more resources, then you need every year to write a small proposal. And most of the time, you will have what you what you ask for. Uh, so there's, there are HPC all over Canada. So it's, uh, it's cool. You can have talk with your local HPC. And why it's cool is because, and why I talk, because we develop a, a partnership with them. And uh, we are in charge of maintaining all my informatics tools uh, in their systems, so to install uh, all the tools and all the tools to be um, installed in the same way, in the same fashion in every um, in every um, um, cluster. We also provide genomic resources to help um, bioinformatics and genomics uh, field, and uh, we also provide all the set of uh, well uh, standardized and high quality pipeline that people can directly use. So all what you see today, you can reproduce on Compute Canada using uh, the pipeline. Uh, if you want more detail on the pipeline, uh, this is where the, the, the pipeline are, are hosted uh, for the code. And you can also send us an, an email. Um, that All this initiative is part of a GenApp consortium that we are part of, uh, where the goal is to standardize um, geno uh, genomics resources for the community, uh, and also to offer for people that don't want to code Another a type of uh, um, analysis uh, facilities which is called Galaxy. Because we don't develop Galaxy, but we have installed Galaxy, uh, a Canadian Galaxy version, which is directly working on Compute Canada nodes. So it's more efficient. And it also allows you to create some kind of data hub to share your data between your, your collaborators. So now, finish my wonder talk. Uh, let's talk about um, small variant coding. OK. so. Why people are doing small variant coding? So it's come from the, um, the, all the genome sequencing effort, where people uh, generate this large, massive project where they try to sequence a lot and lot of people, a lot of lot of people. Uh, so what they want to do in that case is, is to know to understand what are the individual variation of each people, but what are the shared variation between people. So it's why 
um, as the interest in variation come to become a really major task in the in the field. It's also really important when we do cancer genomics. For example, uh, we are part of a, of a different consortium, one which is called Profile, where we have some kids and young adults that are resistant to uh, tr um, traditional treatment in, in cancer. And what we have, we have, when we receive a sample, we have, a, we have two weeks to find their variation, their somatic variation, try to um, provide this variation to a um, <coughs> clinician so they can adjust um, their therapy or, or try them new therapy. So it's really important to, to be able to have a good um, um, quality of variant coding and uh, to be uh, confident what, what we provide. It's also used a lot in agricultural crop and other many, other many fields. Uh, so as we described yesterday, this is our uh, main workflow uh, for, for the variant, for the DNSSEC and variant coding. So yesterday we saw uh, the first part, the data processing, and today we also saw this part, uh, which looks longer than this one, but it's not longer. It's more complicated, it's more, um, but it's in terms of, of steps, it's way more, uh, uh, way, lot, uh, way less uh, step to do, but more uh, reflection to have. So a summary of how we, we work. So as I say, when you want to do this kind of analysis, the first thing to do is to do quality control, look at your data, is my data is good. Then you do processing, reprocessing, mapping, and then when you have a real good mapping, you do some uh, small variant coding and some structural variant coding. Uh, why it is important to have good quality control? Uh, because it's really important uh, to, if you want to compare samples, you need to have a good quality of your sample because otherwise one with lower quality will have some uh, technical and artificial variants that will appear. So it's really good that all of your samples are good quality, but also all of your samples are coming from the same protocol, from the same instrument. So it's really, really important when you do that to, to, to think about that. Uh, we saw some people that go um, generate some data and then look in databases of, for variants and say, oh, I, I don't find my variant, but in that databases, um, for example, you, they don't use the same exome kits than you, so they don't cover the same region. So it's normal that some variants are missing, but you need to know, you need to understand all this concept before trying to um, compare what you see in one sample to the other. Um, so it is, as I say, it is really, really important if you, tr if you want to compare different samples or different conditions. This, uh, this applies for DNSSEC, but this will apply for RNSSEC and all your um, SIC. Um, um, uh, um, technology or, or, or project. So as I say, we will look at small variant coding and we'll first look at uh, how we can do um, the, the, the real coding. So when we do single nucleotide variant coding, uh, what we want to do, we want to find some SNPs, so some uh, region in the, in the genomes where you have your reference gene sequence and you want to find some, some position where in your sample uh, what we observe at the same position is different to what we have in the reference. So it looks simple like that because it's oh yes, it's obvious when you look at this graph. Um, so here another way to show that, where it starts to be still obvious to say okay, I've got a SNP here, uh, and you can see we have a an iterator that I got SNP here. And here, so the, the goal is to make the difference between this position, which is a real SNP, and this other position, which are sequencing error. Uh, so what we can what, what we can see from that first um, uh, slide is one of the main uh, important factors to do that is coverage. If I got if I got enough coverage, uh, I should be able to find my SNP. Why? Because if I have a real SNP. I will have an accumulation of evidence at the same position, where our sequencing errors are random. So you don't expect to see uh, all these sequ sequencing errors that appear at the same um, location. For sure, there are other type of error artifacts, kits that could generate this uh, non-random errors or non-random false uh, variants. Uh, but in general, the concept is there. So why it's um, why 
uh, coverage is important because imagine now uh, around like 10x, so it's it's easy to want. now imagine I have only three x, making all only the three last um, sequence, making the difference between my sequencing error and my snip become really really complicated. Okay, another another important parameter to take into account when we do when we try to do uh, snip calling is base quality. So I will not we explain what is base quality. We have seen it yesterday, but it's really it's really important because when you start to look a read, if we saw okay, this is a this this is my read, this is my my, my reference. If I see okay, I've got here a variation which is really high quality. Uh, it could be a sequencing error or a PCR error at the beginning, for sure. But I will have more confidence to say oh, this is something that's really in my read than here. I have a, a lower uh, base quality and. Is it, or is it really um, a sequencing error or is it a real variation? It's more tricky to, to, to make, uh, to, un to understand. So it's, it's important and especially uh, we'll see later that most of the, um, of the, of the um, uh, variant color take uh, the, the base quality into their uh, formula to, to do the variant calling. So when we do um, SNP and genotype calling, uh, the summary: We have the, match, the machine. We we do the, the, the base the base calling. We generate fast queues and we map our reads. Uh, then we um, improve our um, alignment. And then uh, there's two way of doing the variant calling. Um, so you can do either a single sample calling. So each sample you will do uh, you, you will call the variant individually. Uh, this is done when you have only one sample, <coughs> or when there are some uh, specific, for example, in tumor, you will do, usually you do single sample coding or paired sample coding, uh, which means one sample which is a uh, normal blood. In that cases, uh, you try to identify the SNP and the genotype at the same time. So you use Bayesian or threshold approach. So threshold is when you have really, really high coverage, uh, you can just count and if you have enough, uh, if you have between 25 and 75 uh, percent of your uh, of your uh, variant read, you say, okay, I, I got a, a, a heterozygote. Uh, but if you don't have super high coverage, most of the most of the of the method we use a Bayesian approach or a t-test approach when you look at some um, somatic um, color. But this is not the way, the best way to do it. If you have enough sample, uh, you should go with multi-sample calling. So what is multi-sample calling? The idea is to take all your samples together and to mix the information of uh, all samples, not to, not to determine the genotype of your sample, but to find all the possible region in your genome where it could possibly have a SNP, SND. So using the information of everybody, you will find all the, the position that you, there are probably some variation. So the idea is really to increase your level of information. Then you get your, your, your target, and then you develop a maximum likelihood estimate approach where you will go back with the information to each sample and uh, do the genotyping. Saying, okay, at that position where I think there's a, vari there's a possibly a, a variant, uh, this one will be um, referent reference, this one will be heterozygote, this one will be um, homozygote alternate. So, and it's work uh, way better than uh, doing in a um, single, sam single um, sample calling. Is that not using your data twice? Sorry? Is that not using your data twice? No, because the, you, don't do, you don't do the same thing. The, 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 in the first part, you really mix all the information to say, OK, have enough evidence to say this, this region is probably container variant in some samples. I don't know why. Yeah, I don't know which one. It's just that I take all my read and say, OK, I, I accumulate evidence of variant read at that set. And then you, you, you go back and you, you try to decipher the signal you have used by sample to do the genotyping. So you don't use exactly the, 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 the you, you use the, the information twice, but not for the same purpose. So I will not go in detail because I know a lot of people, when I start to explain some mathematical formulas, they start to, uh, to, to, to sleep. 
So, <laughs> uh, just to let you know, so when we do variant coding, we try the so idea to try to find the genotype, the given genotype in the sample, knowing the data we observe on the on the at the sequence level. So uh, basically, it means to understand uh, the to the likelihood of each genotype depending on the data and which is correlated to the likelihood of each haplotypes. Uh, so you use with all, all of the color use Bayesian approach with a different type of, um, of formula. Um, so what is important to understand is that uh, this uh, likelihood of haplotype is driven by how many bases you count at its low side, and this is driven by the, the quality of the base you are looking at. So it's why keeping high quality is important when you do um, variant coding. Nobody, nobody sleep? Okay, can uh, So, as I say, it's not important to, under, to know perfectly each formula because each, each color will use different uh, formula to, to the variant coding. So when you will have choose one, you will be able to, to, to go more in detail. What is more important, I think, to understand is how we can improve the variant coding. So this is the four uh, main way to do it. Uh, we yesterday already see three of them, but we will go over uh, over, the, over all of them today again. So the first thing is to do a local realignment. Uh, why? Because it's a, um, first, it's a, um, it really improves how you call indels. That being said, there's no real good color for indels. Uh, I, I want you to know um, there's no really good color for um, single nucleotide variation, but indel are still um, are still really hard to call. And uh, but this one improve how we call indel, and improve also how we call SNP by reducing a lot of false positive. So as I said yesterday, a lot of um, aligner tend to favor introducing mismatch instead of in introducing gap. So we uh, quite often observe this kind of region where we have some accumulation of, uh, of uh, variation uh, in the, in the, depending on how the, the, the read is mapped, so possible variation. And usually, we have some other, in the same region, we have some other SNPs that show uh, insertion. And when we saw this kind of weird pattern, the, the software will try to move the different, the different reads and see if it's um, give a better alignment of the region. And when you see when we do before and after alignment, the two close snip that were here completely disappear when we uh, introduce the indel for, for uh, almost all the reads, which means that there was a real indel there, uh, probably an homozygous uh, indel. And by realigning the, the read around this indel, we uh, remove two probably false positive snips. So it can really help. The other type of improvement we can use is to, uh, to mark or remove duplicate reads. So just look at the uh, top uh, cartoons here. So with it, this is what you will face in your, in your data. So you will say, OK, I'm looking at this region. I've got my reads. And oh, I've got an accumulation of reads uh, that show a variation, so a lot of evidence of a variation in, in that uh, position. So clearly, if I don't, if I'm not looking at and taking into account some in, external information, I would say, okay, I will probably have a variant there. But it will be a false positive variant uh, because if you look well, this is exactly the same DNA fragment, the same fragment originally. So if I only count twice, oh, then I only have one evidence, and it's really more unlikely that this is a real variant. So. This is why it's important to mark or remove duplicates. Base quality recalibration. Uh, it's hard to, tell, to show by a scheme or a cartoon how it impacts, but it's just based on, we saw the, the, the formula at the beginning. It formula, Bayesian formula really uh, rely on base quality of each basis. So having the best model or the best quality on your data is really important. Now, a new concept uh, is to improve uh, the variant calling 
is uh, using um, familial population uh, structure and, imputa and imputation. So how, what I mean by that? So imagine you know from your population are using like large uh, population uh, project like um, Nomad or like uh, UK Biobank or so, so, so genome project, you know the haplotype of, uh, in, in your population. And you've got these two haplotypes. Then you, you are doing your uh, sequencing in your sample. You know it's a sample, come from the same population, and you face this situation. So what would be the value for n? Be careful, there's a small trap, a color trap. Don't trust the color. <laughs> OK, so you will say, OK, probably I have a lot of, there's a high probability that at this position, I've got a T. So it's what we do when we call imputation. When we have this region where, for example, we, la we, we have a lack of coverage, we don't have enough coverage to be able to call a real variation, to, to have enough, enough information to call variants, then we can use the population to be able to grab uh, the information from other resources and to um, introduce that in your, in your data. When we use multi-sample coding, an information. This is a, a, an old um, an old slide, but uh, just to give you a look at this uh, this um, amount is a, uh, up the accuracy of a genotype coding when we do it between uh, multi sample, single sample, multi sample, and population approach. So we can see that we have a real way more um, higher um, accuracy on doing coding using multi sample and population approach. Another way to, um, to improve your uh, variant call, which is usually made after you do your call, it's to use uh, a, a family structure, for example, trios. In that case, is you have two parents and a child, and you are usually interested in the genotype in the child, but you, gen you genotype the three uh, samples. And what you will use, you will, by using the structure, you will take advantage of duplication of data, as we do for, for, for the multi-sample coding. But what is interesting in that structure is you can also integrate additional information, like the Mendelian, Mendelian segregation of alleles, which means that each allele that you will find, or not each, but almost every allele that you will find in the child should come from one or the other parent. No, there are some also uh, the, the novel mutation, and it allows you to detect if you see really high quality variant that is not found in the parents, uh, and you really trust and validate, you are also able to uh, estimate the, uh, the novel mutation rate. So, a lot of um, new, um, uh, new, new, a lot of um, uh, additional feature you, you can uh, you can add in your new data. So, just to give you an idea, when we do variant coding, uh, we start from BAM file with our two hundred. In mean 200 gigabytes, but it go less or, or really more. And then uh, we uh, end up usually for world genome of one gigabyte file, which is the raw, uh, uh, the raw VCF, so VCF means variant called format. And there's many, many tools to do that. Uh, mostly we'll use um, uh, GTK, which is one of the uh, most performant color, which is called haplotype color. Uh, but other color exist like SAMTool, Freebase, Cortex, and one of my uh, main message here, I'm talking about uh, traditional uh, DNSSEC. If you are doing cancer, uh, forget about that. It's completely a completely different type of uh, variant color. Because in cancer, there's a lot of other many uh, parameters to take into account, like purity, uh, cellularity, uh, um, clonality. So this color are not. Uh, dedicated to, to work with cancer. So here it's really the color dedicated to do a traditional uh, world genome or world exome um, uh, variant call. So what is the VCF uh, file? So VCF, I say, uh, mean variant call format. Uh, so in your VCF, and yesterday I don't talk about that, but it's the same, not the same, but there's Always, uh, there will be always an either in your file. So you will have a set of lines with different information before you have your real um, uh, variant call and um, genetic information. 
yesterday when I present the BAM file, BAM format, uh, I don't tell you uh, that, but it's the same. In all BAM, you will have an header, which is not, not the same as the VCF. And what is interesting in, in that header is that it contains many, many information to understand your file. And it contains also uh, all the information, all the steps of processing to generate your file should be in the header. If you use standard tools, they will always put what they have done in the header file. So if you receive a VCF, if you receive a BAM, you will be able, looking at the header, to know how this file has been um, created. So here you've got, the, so when you have the double um, pawn sign, uh, it's really to describe the format. Uh, so you've got uh, which reference, you've got uh, info that correspond to that field. So you know all this info here will be okay. NS here mean uh, number of samples with data. You know, DP will mean uh, depth, uh, total depth. So you got all this information where you are able to track back on the from the from the header. So when you look at the data, um, so you will have for each uh, variant, you will have the position, so the, which chromosome, which position, an ID. So not all VCF will have an, an ID uh, at the beginning because when you do calling, it will not know uh, where if the data has an ID, if the, if the variant exists or not in database. So you will have to fill this ID field. Um, what is seen as reference? What is seen as alternate alleles? The quality of call. If you apply some filtering on the data, it will tell you if you if you uh, if you if you variant. Uh, pass or not uh, this filter. So at the beginning, they, will, they, they could have some 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 uh, variant color will already do some pre-filtering for you, so they, this information could be uh, filled, or some other will not do. They will just do call, and you will have to do filtering uh, by your own. And in that in that cases, it will be just a dot. Then you've got uh, the info field, <coughs> which give general information of the variant calling for all sample. Then you have the format field. So the format is just to descri describe what will be in the next column for individual genotyping. So here I tell you you will have a GT, which is the, the genotype, which is all, always there. And you will have other, like DP, which will be the depth in each sample. And then you apply. So you see all the fields are, are separate here. And you see the same separation. And you can have your uh, different information. What does the GT mean? GT is genotype. So what's the number mean like when you see the number? So you've got number. So genotype would be either like that, 0 slash 1, which will or oh, So the number will be, in general, you will have slash or pipe 1, slash or pipe 0, slash or pipe 1. This is the three main genotypes you will see. There's other, you will see there's other here. So in the middle, slash or pipe, depend of if you have, uh, if you don't have um, um, uh, phase your data, you will have only slash. When your data has been phased, it will be pipe. Just a way to recognize your data. It will be one haplotype and the other. Okay? But most of the case, at the beginning, you will only have the slash, okay? Because you don't have you don't face you don't have face your data. Zero zero mean uh, reference. This is LL zero. This is LL one. So, oops. Zero zero will be homozygote reference. Zero one will be heterozygote. One one will be uh, homozygote variant. Now we'll see here in that two line that alternate allel could be more than one. Alias. Right. And in that case, it's what we observe here. We have a genotype which is called one slash two. So because when you have in the alternate here, um, when, you, when you have a comma, which has the different alternate allel you can see, it will be allel zero, allel one, allel two and so on if you have more than one. 
So here, when you will see one, two, it's a GT genotype. Yes? What, what you don't know is uh, what's the, what the combination or what the number 0, 1, 2 means? Or both? Combination. So it's a combination. So when you have genotype, you have two alleles. In terms of alleles, they are noted like that. Allele, uh, reference is allele 0. First alternate allele is allele 1. And second alternate allele, if, it, if there's any second alternate allele, is allele 2. So 0, 1 will be heterozygote. One allele reference, one uh, first allele um, uh, alternate. 0, 0 will be homozygous uh, reference. 1, 1 will be uh, homozygous variant. In our case, 1, 2 will be heterozygote, but with two allele variants. Sorry, what is the, the N-A-O-O-1 and N-A-O-O-2 on the right side? It's the name of the sample. So each one is correspond to the genotype codings that have been done on each sample in the file. So and each, um, each field is described by the format field. I have a question about that the multiple samples that you talked about, mm -hmm. um, what criteria would you use to determine which multiple samples you're combining together to call at the same time? Like, would they all come from the same library, or could you just take a whole yeah, yeah. bunch of No, you, you, so you need to call people, uh, samples from your own experiment all together, and with an harmonized uh, libraries, sequencing, and, and so on. If you, if you start to include sample with different, for example, example, example kit or different sequencer, it won't work. So it should be the most harmonized as possible. So you will do that. And after, if you want to include information from other, then you will start to do some imputation or comparison. Yeah. So yeah, when you phase, you use uh, information usually from population and also from the BAM file, depending also on the site of your reads. For example, if you use um, uh, 10x genomics to do really long reads, artificial long reads, or if you use uh, PacBio nanopores that have long reads, you can use this information. But in small, in small uh, read approach, you could have you could do some phasing based on the reads, but the, your phase block will be really uh, small. Uh, no, because um, all the genome we are looking, all the reference are applied. So you always, actually, you always align your data on uh, a fluid reference. So take the reference. So you don't need a, a, a liner. When you want to do diploid, when you want to use a diploid reference, then you will have to, do, to, to use some specific aligner or some kit along aligner to tell there's two copies of the same uh, of the same uh, but just for the alignment part it's uh, all the reference genome by default are applied version of the, of, the, of the genomes for the variant coding it will be different for the variant coding you should inform your your variant colors that you should, you are on applied uh, situation so you, it will be on the Homozygons. There's no heterozygons. So for the variant coding, yes, you need either to change your variant co your variant color or to inform the number of uh, haplotypes you have in your in your um, in your um, experiment. So many many color have these parameters to tell you. And by, by default, are two, but you can set up at four, one, eight, depending on, on your on your data. But for the alignment, no. Um, it's complicated. It's depend on each um, variant color because uh, they don't compute the same 
uh, with a different type of quality. Uh -huh. uh, so uh, most of the time, uh, I would say around that for uh, applied for applied color, uh, genotype quality around more than forty start to be a good one. Sometime when we really want good good quality call, when we do, for example, when we want to do some imputation, we only want to keep the real the, the call that we know we really trust, mm -hmm. and we uh, we do at uh, 60. 60 uh, yes. What's when you are when you are uh, calling for structural variance, does the same approach apply to structural variance? What do you mean? Uh, like uh, in what you explained, uh, small uh, small uh, variance. Yeah. So when you are doing for large variance, like what you call the structural variance, it's like is it the same approach? Uh, for, for the variant call? No, it's a completely different uh, approach and a completely different method, and we'll see that later this morning. Okay. So now that we have done our, um, our um, variant call, what is interesting to do is to filter our data and to do some kind of um, annotation. Uh, so when you want to filter your data, there's two main uh, approach you can use to do that. Uh, First one is to do um, what we call hard filtering, so to go and manually filter your data. So uh, there's a tool in a GTK which is called Variant uh, Filtration, or in a SNP Filt, which is a, one of the, the software that is included in the SNPF uh, uh, tools. Uh, and what you want to, what we will do in that case is you will you will know some criteria. Criterion, and you will use it to remove all your variants that are don't uh, fit this criterion. So, for example, you say we talk about base quality. Like, okay, I want to keep all my data with a quality score of 60 on a region where I have at least, for example, 20 x of coverage, etc., etc. It works really well. It's really efficient, but it's difficult because you need to really understand. You, the algorithm you have used to do the calling, all the parameters, all the different parameters to have, the, to have this, really this expertise on each criterion and how it affects your data. And it will require you to do a lot of benchmarking to find the best uh, set of criteria. Uh, the other method, which is more um, um, something which is more uh, um, a machine learning approach is uh, to uh, let learn some uh, rules based on what you have in your data, and then use that to uh, do the, um, the filtration phase, what we call the variance calibration. Uh, so this method works really well, but here it has one main disadvantage: is that you mean uh, that you need for to apply this a lot of samples. I would say there's no Numbers that have been fixed because it depends on how many sample pair, uh, how many variant per sample. But usually, when you have less than 20 samples, it, it will probably won't work. The algorithm will fail because they don't have enough information to do the learning. Uh, so today we won't perform that. We will do the, the first one. Uh, but in general, uh, when we have large cohort, we use the other one. So how it works? Uh, it works uh, in, in a so it's a machine learning based approach. So what it do? It takes um, databases like Omni, Southern Journal, AppMap to extract a core set of variants. So it's a it's a it's a set of variants in your uh, in your samples that are part of this different consortium. And so it's a, a variant that are really likely to be true positive variants. So we'll select these true positive variants and learn rules about these variants. So the different parameters could be depth, it could be variant quality, but all other it could be um, uh, uh, strong, it could be all the all the parameters, the information that have been provided by the caller. Then it will apply. Um, the rule to all the variants in your data, in, in all your sample, 
and then you would tell, tell him, I want a sensitivity of, for example, 99% or 99.9%, uh, .9%, and you will apply the rule to get your sensitiv the sensitivity you want and to select the variant that fits into uh, this uh, sensitivity. How many VCFs would you start off with? I mean, it's sample, yeah. because I will have one VCF, but with for that... Yeah, how many uh, different samples would you choose? I will start between 20 to 30 samples. 20 to 30 samples. Yeah, okay. but the more, the better. And is there specific information you're extracting from your DCMs? Like, what are your features? Um, you, um, that's one of the one of the main of the main disadvantages is you don't know exactly what are the feature that have been used. Okay. It's like it's can you, you I think you can dig a bit, uh, but you don't have a clear uh, a clear set of features that you can use after that to redo it manually. To so. Won't it throw it out? Like, if you're extracting variants, right, from these public yeah. databases, like, isn't the algorithm going to expect <coughs> your data to have certain information in order to, like, run the machine learning algorithm? Like, what do? It's it's what what sort of data is the algorithm expecting to have in order to run? Uh, so the it's BCF from uh, your sample. So. Yeah with the different information you have in your VCF, and it's um, uh, VCF uh, of other databases. So it's a variant of the non-variant of other databases. So it's just what you need to, to have. Okay. Uh, so we talk about databases, so AppMap and DBSNIP. So it's what we, what we can use to try to understand uh, our variants, so the AppMap is uh, a way to, so it's a big project uh, that provides a lot of uh, information. There's no, also, um, uh, it's a 10, it's a 10,000, uh, 100,000 uh, genome in UK that is ongoing uh, to provide like this high quality uh, variant that help, helps you to, to drive for false positive. And you have also DBSNIP. DBSNIP is Whenever somebody, uh, it's really dated. It's like 148, I think now, the version. And uh, you have million million of SNPs. So here, it's more to, to, to detect uh, for false positive. So when you have <coughs> filter your variant using a uh, different approach, what you want to do is to do an annotation of your data. So what we currently, what we often use is the uh, mappability flag. So we, us, we use our own mappability uh, track that we develop, uh, but there are some mappability tracks that are uh, available from Ensemble and other consortium. The idea is to look at, uh, to flag the region of the genome where you know there's mappability issue. Either there could be lower reads, so more difficult to map in this region, or uh, excess of reads, so a lot of repeats could arrive in this region, and probably they will be false positive. So it's just tell you to, to flag to tag some variant to say, okay, this is this variant is on region I'm not really trusting, so I will don't put all my money on that variant. Um, so the BSNIP, which helps you to know uh, if the variant you are uh, looking at is already known and have already been reported by other groups. So if you are looking for rare variant or rare disease, but you see that this is a common variant that is known, uh, you will say, okay, this is not the one I, I will be interested in. Um, no, you have really the, the, the real interesting um, um, annotation we usually use. It's to do to com to try to understand what is the effect of my variant. So there's many tools to do that. Us, we use uh, and we will use today SNPF. Um, so the idea is to look at the you, you take all the uh, transcript, uh, and if a variant covers a transcript, you look uh, the position in the transcript, the frame, and everything, and you are able to predict the effect. Of the variant in, in, in on the gene, will it change? Do, will it create a stop codon? Will it do a, just a, a synonymous a change, or, or whatever? So if you are looking in, in your, into your variant, it's, if you doing a, if your variant creates a stop codon in a protein, the impact of this variant is way more important than you just do a synonymous change, where you say, okay, you don't have a real impact, direct impact. You could have impact in the tree structure or other, but. Uh, uh, not a, a, such a major impact. Um, DBNFCP, 
NSFP, sorry, uh, it's to have a functional annotation of the change, so it's a, a bit different. It's more uh, at the level of, of pathway and, uh, and protein structures. And if you work in cancer, it's, uh, there's a cosmic databases you can use to see if this uh, variant have already been reported as somatic mutation linked to a specific cancer. What's your cut for, for saying that this is a variant? So let's say you have like 100 read per area that cover, sorry, that cover a base and only 10 of them have a variant. Would you call it a variant? After all the filtering, you see. Uh, in germlines, it would probably not be either in the traditional data. If I have like 10% of my read, of my read uh, it would need to be really, really good quality and perfect matching and to, to be well, otherwise it will probably be uh, discussed as possible uh, false positive. Okay. Because you expect to have, uh, in the normal cases, if you don't have a uh, metabolity issue, if you don't have uh, duplication or whatever, you expect to have 50% uh, of your weight on the, on the to be, uh, variant for heterozygous. No, you. You expect Sorry. you expect the read variant read frequency to be like that zero to one percent and you expect to have here zero zero one So, if you fall here, you could have depending on the on quality of read and, and, and so on, but it may be hard to, to, to trust this one if you are in a in a in a normal germline uh, way of viral coding. If you are in tumor, it's completely different because, as we say, we have for it, purity, causality, heterogeneity that take into account and that can totally modify this. Um, so today oops, we'll do annotation with a SNPF. As I say, as I explained, it will uh, look at the uh, annotate based on the reference genome and on the different transcript. It will look at uh, coding variants or not coding, so in transcriptome factor binding site. And it will do a basic parameterization of your um, variant, telling you if it's high impact, moderate, low, or modifier. It will also provide some metrics which is always good to have. Um, so when we do, as I say, when we do biofarm, we go to variant. It takes usually a couple of hours to, to, to do it. Um, but when we do uh, annotation, doing the annotation could be really easy to get your field of data. But having a real annotation by somebody that knows and knows the biology behind uh, the project and having him looking at the data, taking the, the variant, looking at the gene that is impacted could take days, months, and whatever. So it's the hardest part that we won't do today. But uh, there's other workshops in bioinformatics.ca where you can learn more about how you can um, increase your expert judgment. <coughs> there's one in Montreal in mid June, I think. It's genomic medicine uh, workshop. Um, I think, oh, yeah. You already saw that yesterday, just to let you know. Um, uh, VCF could be open in uh, IGV, so it's, uh, it's easy to have. Uh, it's interesting to have the, the information when you look at it. Usually what you have is uh, here in the, in the top panel of the VCF uh, part of in IGV, you will have uh, the frequency among your sample of the variant, and then you will have a description of the variant for each sample. Um, one of my general message, metrics, 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 metrics. I need to update uh, that next uh, next time to uh, put some multi-QC instead of uh, this uh, old uh, fashion uh, report. And just to let you know, um, so SNPF, what is cool is it provides also a lot of statistics on 
the variant, and we'll, we'll see during the practical uh, later today. OK. Um, any question? Can yeah. Yeah. No, uh, but because it's uh, just on high throughput sequencing, so it's, there's other workshop on genomics here. Me, I'm teaching also in UK and a, a full week of cancer genomics, and I can talk a bit, but it's a totally different world. So it's why we cannot talk. Otherwise, it would take days and days to to to, to talk about that. But do you have any question on cancer genomics? Well, I work mostly on cancer genomics, so uh, I, I know it's way more difficult to call something a true variant, which is like ten percent, fifty percent. There. Yeah, exactly. So you have all in cancer. You have all. So you have problem with cancer is first you don't try to look at the same information because here we talk about germline variant in cancer. Sometimes. You could be interested in germline variant or LOH variants, but a lot of people are more interested in what is, what is called somatic variants, which are the, the variants that are found only in the cancer uh, cells and not in the, in the germline. So first, it's, it's more difficult because we work in paired approach, where we have usually a blood samples with a tumor samples. And what we want to do is try to find what in the tumor sample is different from the, from the blood samples. That's the classical case, is because if you look at if you if you work with, for for example, a leukemia, which is a blood cancer, you don't use blood. So, more complication uh, again. So we still have this other approach that we we so this paired approach that we we that make us using different tools and different uh, methodology to do uh, to do variant calling, but then we have uh, the cancer specific. Um, challenge, which has when you take um, data from uh, cancer cells, many cells, many on your sample, many cells are dead. So the purity of your sample, uh, and many cells could be, and also your, your sample could be a mix of is always a mix of normal cell and tumor cells. So the mm -hmm. real number of cells you have in your sample, it's a percentage. It could be ninety percent. It's good, but sometimes it could be. 30% of your data that are real data from that, that are real cancer cells. So imagine you have 30%, then you have all the heterogeneity of the of the of the cancer, and you have the clonality. So not all the cells in cancer should say should show the same variant. So if you have a clone which is 50% of your cell, of your cancer cell, in a sample which have only 30% of your uh, of, of your cell is cancer, you only look at 15% of your reads that could represent uh, a clone, which is heterozygote, which is 7% of your reads. So you can imagine how complicated it becomes for the variant color to do, to do things. So all these variant colors that are based on a model where we expect 50% of reads would fail to do that. So it's why it's a totally different world to do when we work in, uh, in cancer. <clears throat> yes? Um, just to go back to the four strategies to improve your data. Uh, before you do your variant calling, the local yeah. realign alignment is to correct for potential indels in your sample. Yes, it's to because as I say, go back there. Yeah, yes. If you have indel, which is uh, if you have a real indel in your data, it's. Where it's uh, likely that not all your reads will be mapped, including the indel. All the reads that contain the indel will be mapped uh, with the indel. Because, as I say, alignment is a, is a uh, penalty uh, models. And most of the time, including um, uh, substitution, costs less than including uh, indel, especially for indel for several, several bases. So in that case, you will have some reads that don't Include the indel, and instead have several uh, um, substitution or several uh, variant read uh, in the in the closed area of the indel. So the idea is to go where you think there's an indel, and to just play with the reads and see if I include my indel, will it create a more 
um, harmonized uh, region and a more uh, high quality region. And then what was the base recalibration correcting for again? So the base recalibration is correcting for each base in the sequence to give him the correct numbers that it should be depending on his position on the read on the genomic context around him. Because the base, uh, the base quality is used in the Bayesian uh, algorithm to uh, estimate uh, the probability of, um, of a variant. So the, I cannot show you a cartoon to tell you how it works, because it's more at the level of, uh, at the really back level, but uh, it's an impact. OK? I, yeah. Yes. That you showed, uh, we have three. Uh, it's a vicious. Yeah, sorry. Uh, vicious, yeah. Uh, we have three types of uh, data and their qualities. So, um, so you have to decide between these three. Where? Uh, at the end, in NA001 and yes. 2 and 3. Yes. Now, this is a tree sample. Oh, this is three. Okay. Yeah, so this, the ninth column format, mm -hmm. is a description based on either what will be the information displayed for that variant in every sample. Then you have each sample individually that displays information in the same order, like what is present in the format. Oh, okay. why, why is the fourth one a variant? Fourth one, no, I think it's not a variant. Okay. Probably, probably it has been, as I say, multi-sample approach. They they look first in the in the in the genomes to find position that are, where where there are possibly variants. So they look at they find this position. Maybe some read in each sample. There was few reads that that have been that have been found as possible a variant. So they they put it in. Uh, position they will look for variant, but at the end, when they do the maximum likelihood, they say, Oh no, no, no sample seems to have something, so probably it's not a variant, so that's why it's, uh, it's here. Yeah? I have to ask you another question about the multi sample approach then. Let's say you have an overseeing exome run with 96 exomes. Yeah. A couple of the samples come in with really low coverage, then would you include those with your, with your what you call them? Yeah. Still yeah, probably you will end up with less quality samples. So the, the quality of the quality uh, the sample will be lower due to the, the, the lower quality of your data. But as you use the same kit, exome kit, the same sequencing approach, it just it has less information. So taking information from the other would be the best way to uh, maximize what you can uh, get from this data. If you separate them with so much information, you will have really a low level. Here you will be probably able to to get uh, some code that you will release if you do single sample. But you would still do multi-sample, but let's say a, a few of the samples had really low coverage. 90 of them were really good, six of them were really low. Did yeah. you include the six? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Because, as I say, it's the same, it's a, a st standardized sequencing experiment. So you just miss information. So try to get this information from the other. Use, use the other that have a lot of coverage to try to define where the, the, the good sites are. And then when you go back at the maximum likelihood, you will get what you get based on the coverage you got. So maybe, you, I say, you will have a lot of false negatives, probably. But uh, you will probably have more uh, false uh, true positives than if you only separate these six and analyze these six. After that, when you do, if you do some analysis with, the var with your variants, perhaps it will be time to think, should I include this one, which have a different, uh, which have lower call uh, in my, for example, in my case control analysis, because they are not at the same quality. But for variant coding, I would definitely include them. Maybe the, I don't know, for you, but uh, is this this slow six uh, quality sample that have an No, they will have a, a low weight, and as I say, it's, this, 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 at the moment it's not different. 
it will not bring um, information that will uh, mislead the other because it will be the same experiment, the same kit, everything. Is, it, it's just that it cannot bring the full potential of information they will have. So for the variant coding, it won't affect it. As I say, for uh, subsequent analysis you will do, then be cautious and think about what you are doing. But for variant coding, uh, I will definitely include them. Yes? This again, the um, multi-sample approach. Yeah. So usually we send I don't know, 10 or 20 samples at a time to, to get sequenced. Mm -hmm. And then those come back and they get run through GATK and all that. But are you saying that when it comes to I know, writing a paper and we've got 150, 200 cases mm -hmm. of the disease or phenomenon that we're interested yeah. in, we would be better to prove all of them and run everything again? Yep. Or is it due to batch effects in the sequencing? Or is, it, is the assumption that the disease is homogeneous uh, underlying it? So, I say if you, are, if you have uniformized how your sample is, have been generated at the beginning, uh, the, if you uh, same library kit, same exam kit if you're doing exam, same instrument, if you see that your run works the same uh, way and everything is okay, I would include. So with with um, uh, applied color, what I will do is to do, um, so when you do, um, instead of, you will do usually uh, indiv individual GVCF, which is uh, a way just to get collect information on your sample without doing anything. Then you will merge your sample by batch of GVCF, and then when you will merge your batch, you will do the, the um, uh, variant coding and genotyping. But all together, yes. And because if you don't do that, the problem is if you have large cohorts, and it's a, a problem for us and for everybody, and it's in terms of resources, is if I was part of a, a consortium that we, um, we analyze um, a thousand Alzheimer's samples, or case and controls, uh, world genome. And we were working by batch uh, and doing uh, multi-sample coding by batch of hundreds of samples. But, and then we start to, for space issue, to remove, to remove the BAM or put it on tape. And then in the, in, the, in the last batch, we start to find some variants that were not included in the other batches. In that case, it's problematic because you, you, you cannot go back, it, or you can, but it's a lot of time and a lot of resources to say, okay, the variant I found here, I didn't find in the other batches. Why? Because I don't have data? Because I don't have evidence? Because whatever? So it's always better to have a final genotyping where you, you take everybody together. So when you look at one variant, you get information, the real information at all the other samples in your analysis. And you say, okay, if I don't see a, a variant there, is either because I don't have read to cover this region or I don't have evidence of the variants and it's a... Uh, it's largely to deal with batch effects. Sorry? It's largely to deal with batch effects. Usually, in, uh, if your run works well, you don't have such a batch effect for variant coding. Uh, after that, uh, we observe some batch effect sometimes because uh, we have a, a failure of the... Of the of the HVAC in the building during a run, yes, that would be something to take into account. But if you are in a sequencing center that run in a production mode, same instruments, same libraries, probably same technicians should give quite similar approach. But after that, you still have the information. <coughs> sorry, you still have the information in your in you, you still keep the information of batch somewhere. So if you start to see. Uh, a variant, some variants that pop up and that specifically to a batch, I would say, uh, oh, perhaps that's a batch effect, but by, by default, I would not uh, put too much pressure. Another thing is <clears throat> we talk about variant, annotation, filtration, but as Amza said yesterday, this is just prediction. Whatever you will do, the interesting variant will go and use an orthodox uh, and, uh, another technology to, um, to validate. Otherwise, people won't accept you, your uh, your variant. So, 
just a matter of prediction. And there's this is super interesting variant, and in the batch, you do a, a single sequencing on your variant, and you will have the, the, the true answer for your or, or my seek high coverage or, or whatever. And you have the answer. Thank you.